Hello and welcome to Star Diary, the podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. You can subscribe to the digital edition of the magazine by visiting iTunes, Google Play or Apple News, or to the print edition by visiting skyatnightmagazine.com. Greetings listeners, and welcome to Star Diary, a weekly guide to the best things to see in the Northern Hemisphere's night sky. In this episode, we'll be covering the coming week from the 25th to the 31st of March. I'm Ezzie Pearson, the magazine's features editor, and I'm joined today by Katrin Rayner. Katrin is an astronomy writer and astronomer who is joining our team of presenters for the first time. So, Katrin, welcome to the show. Hello, Ezzie, and thank you very much for having me. It's exciting. <laughs> so, would you like to introduce yourself to our audience out there so they can know who it is that they are listening to? Absolutely. Thank you. Yep. So I'm an amateur astronomer. And when the sky is clear, I enjoy going outside, naked eye stargazing, or using my six inch Dobsonian telescope. I'm a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, Royal Geographical Society, and I'm a member of the Astrospace Stamp Society. I enjoy collecting astronomy themed stamps. And um, I regularly contribute to the yearbook of astronomy. I write for the sky at night, and Gibbon stamp monthly. And um, I have asteroid 446500 named after me. So my claim to fame there. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the one that I'm always the most excited about is you've got an asteroid named after you. <laughs> How did that one come about? Yes, it was a real honour and a real surprise. I was actually nominated by a friend of mine and he put my name forward. I think it's decided by the International Astronomical Union. Yes, that sounds like the sort of thing they do. <laughs> So he put my name forward with a short description. It was actually Alan Hale of Comet Hale Bop fame who emailed me and he must have had the, it's kind of like, well, not a newsletter, but like an announcement of who'd had asteroids named after them. And he contacted me because we'd been doing some interviews together for a previous radio show during lockdown. And he said, oh, I've just seen your name. I was like, Congratulations. <laughs> said, oh, wow. I was like, I didn't even know it was out. So yeah, that was a real honor, a real surprise. There's a lot of asteroids out there and it's always better to have something that has a name than to call it like XQ3P457 or yeah. however it is that they do these things. Yeah. Like some of the planets that they're discovering, they just have these crazy long names. Uh, so I can't even remember what, what they are. But yeah. You don't. Give it a name. <laughs> On to today's show where in a minute we'll go through everything that's coming up in the week's sky. Now, normally at the top of the show, I say, as we're based in the UK, all times are going to be in GMT. But that's not strictly true in this episode, because here in the UK, at least, the clocks are going to change on the 31st of March in the early hours of the morning. So while most of the times are going to be in GMT, some of them will be in BST. We will try and make it clear which one is which, but assume it's GMT unless otherwise stated. But with that piece of admin out of the way... Katrin, please do tell us what we have coming up for us in this week's night sky. Okay, well, it's a fairly quiet week ahead, with the main highlights being a full moon and a nice celestial pairing between the moon and a binary star. We have two comets hanging around. We have Comet C2021 S3 Pan Stars and Comet 12P Pons Brooks to enjoy. But this week, I'm going to start off with the moon. So on the 25th of March, we have a full moon and a penumbral lunar eclipse which starts at 4.53 a.m. Universal Time and ends at 9.32 a.m. Universal Time. So for those that don't know, a penumbral lunar eclipse occurs when the moon travels only through the outer fainter part of the Earth's shadow or penumbra, and this happens when the Earth moves between the sun and moon, but the three do not form a perfectly straight line. And these types of eclipses are quite easy to miss because the moon's surface only darkens very slightly. So with that in mind, you know, unfortunately, it's not going to be a spectacular event as there won't be any noticeable changes to the moon with the naked eye and the moon will set below the horizon before maximum eclipse. But for those wondering when the next total lunar eclipse is, well, we have a while yet to wait for one. The next one we will see from the UK is the 7th of September 2025. I think I've only ever seen one total lunar eclipse and that was back in 2015. So I look forward to next year. I seen one when I was very young. I have no idea when it was, but it's one of those things I've always wanted to see again. Unfortunately, clouds do what clouds gonna do. Yeah. Um, and so the last <laughs> couple of times I've been able to, or there's been one happening 
it hasn't, <laughs> which is annoying. Yeah, the joys of living in the UK. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we should also say that in terms of other eclipse news, there is a big total eclipse that will be coming up in a couple of weeks on the 8th of April. So do keep your ears peeled for that. And we will have more details about that in our April 8th episode. So the following day on the 26th of March, if you look to the southeast at around 9pm, you will see Speaker or Alpha Virginis, uh, which is the brightest star in the constellation of Virgo, extremely close to the moon. And they're going to be just over one degree apart. So Speaker is very bright. It shines at a magnitude of around one and is the 15th brightest star in the sky. And when we look at Speaker, you know, we see one star, but in fact it is two. And it looks distinctly blue, white in colour, and the pair of stars are both hotter and larger than our sun. But unfortunately, even with an optical aid such as a telescope, you can't actually distinguish or see the two separate stars. Only the analysis of its light with a spectroscope reveals the dual nature of the star. But it's going to be a lovely coupling in the sky to enjoy. You know, I always think it's really magical when a planet or a bright star sits really near to the moon, especially Venus. And I love seeing Venus or Jupiter shining brightly next to the moon, especially at Christmas time. I think it's mm. a lovely seasonal thing to see. It is one of those things that always stands out to me when you're walking home from work or something and the moon is up in the night sky and then you see like a bright star or, a, as you say, a planet next to the moon. It's one of those things that definitely catches your eye and draws you to it. Yeah, it's fantastic to see. I do really enjoy seeing those well, conjunction, I suppose. So whilst you're outside looking at the moon and the constellation of Virgo, try and locate the large semicircular asterism called the Bowl of Virgo, which is formed by five stars of the Virgo constellation. Now, this is a very rough guide on how to find it, and I would recommend using a star chart or app to help you. So once you've found Speaker, cast your eyes in a line upwards and slightly to the right from Speaker until your eyes rest on the next closest brightest star called Parima. And once you've found Parima, you have found one of the bottom corners of the bowl, if you like. And from Parima, a line of stars extends diagonally outwards to the left and to the right, which form the sides of the bowl. But big disclaimer here, it's going to be a challenge locating the bowl unless you are in an area with darker skies. And of course, you know, it's, it's an almost full moon. It's going to be 97% illuminated. It may wash the asterism out. But give it a go and get to know your way around Virgo if you can, because when the moon is out of the way next week, I will tell you how to view the realm of galaxies in this region of the sky. I should also say that if people are looking to find the bowl of Virgo, then we do have guides on how you can go about doing that over on our website, skyatnightmagazine.com. And I will put a link down to them in the show notes below so you can find them nice and easily as well. So a full moon can wash out any fainter asterisms, as I've just mentioned. You know, deep sky objects may be hard to find, comets and stars totally washed out. And a full moon can be a real thorn in astronomers' sides. But if you are interested in learning more about the moon or just getting some observing time under your belt, a full moon can bring a lot of pleasure. There is so much to see and explore with your naked eye or optical aids. You can see craters, seas on Maria and mountain ranges, and you can spot the Apollo landing sites. There's always lots of interesting things to see on the moon. <laughs> oh, yeah, loads, isn't there? And then, you know, a lot of people do complain that, oh, it's a full moon. You know, I want to be outside with my telescope looking at mm. nebulas and open star clusters. But I love seeing a full moon. I really, really enjoy it. And it's one of those things that's very easy and it's very accessible. And it's the first thing that a lot of people recognize in the night sky. And I think if you are just starting out in astronomy as well, it's a really good place to start, isn't it? Because you can see so much more. You don't need to like use a star chart or an app to find it because you just look up and it's there shining brightly. So when I'm looking at the full moon or the moon in any of its phases, really, you know, I might just use my naked eye or a pair of binoculars. And I actually bought a monoscope from a supermarket for around £40 and it's been brilliant for looking at the moon. And it requires minimal effort to step in the garden. And also, I think, you know, you are getting your astronomy fix as well. So with the weather in the UK, you just kind of have to make the most of the clear skies and anything that you can see in it. Absolutely. Moving on to the solar system now. As March comes to an end, we're going to close the month with a couple of cosmic comets. But before that, I would like to mention Mercury. Mercury is difficult to observe from Earth because it always appears too close to the sun. You know, it's rising and setting together with the sun. However, the best time to see Mercury this month will be the 25th of March, when it sets two hours after the sun in the west. 
it will be around magnitude plus 0 0.1, but should still be fairly easy to see in the evening sky. And you know what? I think out of my whole time observing, I've only ever managed to spot Mercury once. It is notoriously difficult. So I don't know if that's my eyesight or <laughs> I just wasn't looking hard enough. But I mean, it's tricky. Yeah, trying to find something that close to the sun, it's never going to be easy. No, not at all. I remember being out once with a group of friends on the top of a valley and they were like, yeah, oh, look, there's Mercury, you can see it. And it literally took me so long to actually manage to locate it. But, you know, it was great. It was good. I was so happy that I managed to spot Mercury that evening. So I actually haven't forgotten it. And that was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. So it made an impact. So throughout March, Comet C2021 S3 Panstars has been an observing target for astronomers. We all love a comet. You know, we don't see them that often and we just don't know what they're going to do. They are very unpredictable, just like the British weather. But later on this week, Comet Panstars will cross the Coat Hanger Cluster, which is an asterism in the constellation of Alpecula the Fox. Now, the Coat Hanger is an open star cluster, so in fact, it's a really good opportunity to view an open star cluster and a comet. So you're really killing two birds with one stone. And on the 31st of March, the comet's crossing will happen at around 3 a.m. British summer time in the eastern sky. You're going to need a pair of binoculars to view the comet, as it's not quite at naked eye brightness yet. So I haven't actually had the opportunity to view pan stars at all because the weather's just been so terrible here. Yeah, I'm not in the best place to be looking for dim comets at the moment, I have to say, because I live in the middle of the city, which is always very distressing when you're talking sure. about it. <laughs> Get told all about all these wonderful stargazing sites coming up and I can't see any of them unless I go out of the city. Yeah. Um... <laughs> You'll have to come to South Wales. Yes, I think that's one of the reasons why I like the moon, because it's one of the things that you can see pretty much wherever you are. Absolutely. Yeah, it's always visible in a city, isn't it? Yeah. One of the things you did mention there was the coat hanger cluster. A couple of weeks ago with Mary, I was talking about how so often there's these asterisms or constellations which have called names which look nothing like what they actually look like. But the coat hanger looks like a coat hanger. It does. Like if you see a set of stars in the shape of a coat hanger, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> You've got it. You found it. Yeah. You know, I agree. I mean, a bit like constellations, isn't it? You know, they have all these names and you just think, well, it doesn't look like a fox or <laughs> or the twins or anything. You know, it's, you have to use your imagination, don't you? Absolutely. So we're going to move on to another comet now, which I'm sure you've all heard about, Comet Bonds Brooks. On the 27th of March, it just clips the corner of the Triangulum constellation as it makes its way towards the constellation of Aries in the west, northwestern sky. Which leads me on to then the 31st of March at midnight, British summer time. Pons Brooks lies less than half a degree from Hamal, a bright star in Aries. So if you locate Jupiter in the west northwestern sky, this is going to help you locate Aries. But however, you know, as we approach the end of the month, the longer, brighter evenings will be problematic for viewing dimmer objects. And you will need a pair of binoculars to view Pons Brooks as well. Definitely. I think also with comets if you can get the chance to go out and see them because they are so unpredictable and you don't know when the next one's going to come. Well, we know when some of the next ones are going to come, but like the long period ones, yeah. they just show up. Yeah. So do try and get out there and see them if you can. And you don't know how long they're going to hang around for either. That's the other thing, isn't no. it? So... Sometimes they can go through perihelion, their closest approach to the sun, and just the heat of the sun just breaks them apart and we never see them again. Yeah. So catch them while you can. So on the 31st of March, whilst you're out looking at Pons Brooks, take this opportunity to enjoy a few deep sky objects, which lie in the constellation of Taurus the Bull, which is close to the constellation of Aries and, of course, the Comet. So locate Taurus to the upper left of Aries. Taurus hosts two fantastic naked eye open star clusters. So Aldebaran, the eye of the bull, a red giant, is positioned within one of these star clusters. And to find Aldebaran, it's quite simple. Just look for a visibly orange star which I have on occasion when Mars has been in the night sky, confused the two. So. <laughs> it's easily done. <laughs> yeah. But you should then be able to make out a clear V-shaped pattern of stars lying on its side. And this cluster is called the Hyades. And then located in an almost straight line to the right is another open star cluster called the Pleiades or M45, commonly known as the Seven Sisters because of the seven stars that you can see. There are various challenges that people do as like how many stars in the Seven Sisters can you actually see with the naked eye, which is a test of both how dark your skies are and how good your eyesight is. Um, <laughs> yes. Again, we have a guide on that on our website. <laughs> <laughs> if people want to, to challenge themselves and see how many they can see. Yeah, it's tricky. Again, I think it's just my eyesight's terrible because I'm pretty sure I can never see seven stars. 
Yeah. Just have to keep looking, keep searching, and maybe you'll <laughs> convince yourselves you can see them one day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just fill in the blanks. But yeah, I mean, generally, I look at Pleiades through binoculars or, or the monoscope that I mentioned when I can't lug out my Dobsonian telescope because it's very heavy. So yeah, something lighter and the binoculars, they, they, they do a good job. Well, sounds like there's lots of interesting things to see in the night sky this week. So thank you very much for taking us through all of those, Catherine. And if at home you would like to keep up to date with all of the latest stargazing highlights, do be sure to subscribe to the Star Diary podcast and we'll hopefully see you back here next week. But to go through all of those again, we're going to start off with the moon this week and there will be a penumbral eclipse of the moon on the 25th of March. Then on the 26th of March, the star speaker is going to be close to the moon near the bowl of Virgo. So definitely look out for those as well. Then in terms of the solar system, Mercury is going to be in the sky throughout the week, but is probably best viewed at the end on the 25th of March. We also have two comets which are making their way across the night sky, um, have been for several weeks so far. Comet S3 pan stars will be visible throughout the week, but on the 29th to the 31st of March, it will be going past the Coat Hanger Cluster. And Pons Brooks will be half a degree away from the star Hamal in Aries on the 31st as well. Whilst you're out looking at Pons Brooks, you might also want to take some time to admire Taurus the Bull and perhaps the Pleiades as well. So lots of things there to look for in the night sky, and we will hopefully see you all back here next week. Goodbye. If you want to find out even more spectacular sights that will be gracing the night sky this month, be sure to pick up a copy of BBC Sky at Night magazine, where we have a 16-page pull-out sky guide with a full overview of everything worth looking up for throughout the whole month. Whether you like to look at the moon, the planets or the deep sky, whether you use binoculars, telescopes or neither, our sky guide has got you covered, with detailed star charts to help you track your way across the night sky. From all of us here at BBC Sky at Night magazine, goodbye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Star Diary podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine, which was edited by Lewis Dobbs. For more of our podcasts, visit our website at skyatnightmagazine.com slash podcasts or head to Spotify, iTunes or your favourite podcast player. Mm-hmm.